morning, everybody. Welcome to church. We'll get you guys to stand up. Let's worship God together. Everybody. Good morning, good morning. You can be seated. You can be seated. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, fantastic. I just have a few announcements this morning. And there they are. Mom's group, Wednesday at 10 a.m. It's going on strong. We're having a great time. Youth Bible study is Wednesday at 7. And I think this is our last one, right, Candace? Yes, this is our last one. Then we're going to break for summer. Uh, men's Bible study, it's still going on Wednesday at 8 p.m. And then it's our youth get wind up this Friday. We're having a good time. If you want to check it out, get a hold of us. We have a Facebook a face group page. Look at Foursquare Youth. Come, we'll add you on that as a private group. Check it out. All the information you need to know is going to be on there. 
Uh, the other thing is we have VBS coming here this summer. Well, I'm excited for that because it's going to be fun. We're going to work with the little kids and we're going to be opening up to the neighborhood and to everybody else who wants to come around. Uh, the theme is Adventure Island. And you got to talk to Candace if you want more because she's going to track down some of you because we're going to need some volunteers to help out with that. And it's going to be fun, right? Yeah. Oh, my God, somebody said yes. I'm glad to hear that. So, and the other thing we have on the list is the Bibles for Kenya. We are raising funds for the Four Square Church in Kenya there. Do they need some Bibles? And we're going to help them out. And right now we're around 250 300 bucks. So we're going for the rest of the month, and we're going to send them a check in July. And, you know, we're trying to hit that $1,300 mark. So let's see what we can do. Other than that, I have nothing else. I'll turn it back over to the worship team. Awesome. That's exciting. A busy church is a good thing. Amen? Let me get you guys to stand back up, and let's continue to worship. Oh, God, you deserve all the glory, God, and all the honor.
This is amazing grace And this is unfailing love That you would take my place and That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be saved I sing for all that you've done for me. And Jesus, I sing. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Yes, tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy that I own and when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken I won't be shaken it's my fear it's my fear doesn't stand a chance when I
God, as we turn our focus to you this morning, God, as we lift you up, as we lift up who you are, God, who you've been in the past, it says that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that has been faithful to us in the past is the same God that will be faithful to us in the present and in the future. God, whatever we're facing this morning, whatever fears, whatever stress, whatever anxiety, whatever unknown that we don't know, even the unknown that we don't even know is coming down the line. God, we know that you will be faithful and that you said that you would never leave us and you said you would never forsake us. And you are a God that is capable, more than capable, and you are willing to walk with us every step of the way. God, and we will be a people that are not silent about the goodness that you have given us, God. About the blessing, about the faithfulness, God, that you give us. We will not just sit on it, God, but we will be speaking of your goodness. We will be sharing of your goodness, God. We will, we will be living in every situation we face, God.
from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me.
is our that is our prayer this morning, Father God. May your Holy Spirit come and just fill our presence, Father God. Lord, we, we invite that. We ask that your Holy Spirit to just stay, to never leave this place, Father God. Lord, that we can have your Holy Spirit just, just lead us in what we do today, Father God. Lord, I pray. I pray we don't ever lose sight of that. And Father God, I pray for this message. Lord, I pray for these words you've given me today, Father God, that, Lord, they would uh, speak to our heart. And Father God, that you would speak to us individually. Lord, that your word would be spoken to us from your lips. And Father God, we would know we've heard from you and you alone, Father God. And that's what we ask for once again. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Ask in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. So before I begin the, the message this morning, I want to make a point of a couple things. And it's found in a few scriptures, starting with 2 Timothy 3. It says, you've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Romans 15.4 says, Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. And 1 Corinthians 10 says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. You know, these three scriptures point to the truth. You know, all, all scripture is inspired by God. It is used to teach us. It's used to correct us, to give us hope, to give us encouragement. And all that we read in the Bible, everything we read in there was written down for us as a warning and as a way to prepare and equip us, God's people, to do every good work. That's the gist of what these three scriptures point at. What they're also saying is that everything written down in the Bible is still relevant to us today. None of it's obsolete. The lessons we have from Genesis to Revelation, it all applies. You know, the Old Testament has the same power and the same meaning as the New Testament. It's a different promise. The truth stays the same, and the words and those promises spoken in the Old Testament are still true today. That's the ground rule I just wanted to lay out this morning so no one could dispute it because I've heard people say we don't need the Old Testament anymore. I've heard people say it's one of those things that's there just for filler that has really no, no purpose anymore. But the scriptures we just read says it's there for a reason, to teach us, to guide us, to equip us as an example for lessons. So with that all said, there, I, I want to make that clear. The Old Testament is very relevant. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be in the Old Testament. So that's why I want to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Another thing I want to point out is first things first this morning Salvation comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. We are saved by grace and not by works. We cannot earn salvation. It's a gift from God. And I say that because what we're looking at today is not about salvation and not about works. It is, however, about our relationship with God. And there's one more thing I just want to say is I'm going to be talking about a principle this morning. And a principle is defined as a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. This is the definition of principle. It is a, tr it is a, it is a rule, or you know, it can be a law, a guideline, a truth even. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at, the, at, a, at a principle. And it is a principle because to hold on to it too rigidly and too tightly would make it legalistic. And if we make it legalistic, that would take absolutely everything away from it. So with that in mind, I, just want, I want to get into the, the message. I was having a conversation with my boss the other day. And she said to me that she found herself home alone and, and, and no one was around. She was home by herself. And all she did was she laid down and she was playing a game on her phone. You know, there, there was nothing else on in the house. There was no radio, no TV. There was nothing. Everyone was gone. The place was silent. Even her phone, her phone volume was turned off, so the game she's playing had no noise. And she said, I just, I just laid there 
with silence, just relaxing, playing this game for like three hours. I just, I just enjoyed the quiet. I enjoyed the rest. It was so relaxing, so peaceful. And I could relate to that. You know, there's, there's moments where the silence is golden. And there's something to be able to have that, that, that zone out period where you can just relax and not think about anything and just, and just enjoy that moment before anything gets busy, before the noise kicks in, before we realize we got to get back to reality and we got to get back to life. To be able to, to take that moment is so good and so refreshing and so needed. You know, I, so coming off that conversation, I was listening to, a, to an interview this week as well. And it, and it really got me thinking about that. You know, and it started with the one who was being interviewed asking a question. And it kind of took the host a, a bit by surprise almost, but I'm sure that was all staged because it probably was happened beforehand. They had the conversations and everything, so it wasn't that big of a shock, but, but his reaction kind of made it think it was. And the man being interviewed asked the host, do you plan on being unfaithful this week? Do you plan on cheating on your wife? And the host had this awkward look on his face, and he laughed, and he was like, oh, no. And, and, and so the questions continued on like that. Do you plan on stealing something this week? No. Do you plan on lying this week? No. Do you plan on murdering someone? Not really. Not at this point. Do you plan on turning away from God and worshiping something else this week? And once again, the answer was, well, no. And the guys asking these questions said, of course not. Of course not. Those are the things we just don't do. We wouldn't do. And if we did them, there are consequences that come. And, and most of these carry serious consequences. If we did any of those, we would be in trouble, right? And that's the conversation they were having. The next question that he asked was, so do you rest one day a week every week? And the host laughed and was like, no. He goes, I have plans to do that. I really try to do that, but I don't. And the one being interviewed made this point, and he said, why not? Why not? It's in the same list as those other things we just read. It's in the exact same list. Deuteronomy 5 says, you, mu you must not take, have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods, for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock and any foreign, foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Everyone. Everyone must not work. And that day shall be a day of rest and dedicated to the Lord. Even the slaves you have must not work. Verse 15. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. But the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. You know, that's the longest and most detailed commandment, the Lord's day. Verse 16, honor your father, father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you. Then you will live a long, full life in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's wife. You must not covet your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your, to your neighbor. That... That, as we know, that is the Ten Commandments. These are the laws that, that we as Christians know we're not supposed to break. You know, our salvation, however, does not, does not rely or, or depend on these commandments. 
And that's a good thing. Our salvation does not hinder on these commandments or we'd still be under the law. Our salvation would then be by works and not by grace. And I think we'd all be in trouble if we relied on these Ten Commandments as setting us straight for salvation. However, some of these commandments are actual laws that we have to live by in society, regardless, regardless if you believe in God or not. And so where we as believers have these commandments, like thou shall not kill, or thou shall not covet, thou shall not have any other gods before me, or images, or idols, the Sabbath finds itself sitting in the number four spot on a list of ten. It's up there at number four. And it follows the ones that point directly to God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. These first four point directly towards God. You know, and following that, we now deal with everything else. You know, Honor mom and dad. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie or perjure yourself. Don't covet. And out of these ten, the Sabbath falls at number four. Out of all of these, right at number four. And so it's for as much value as we hold all these commandments to, as, as much as we, we, we put them in these orders in our mind, we somehow skip over the one where we're told to take off a day each week. One day where we're not to work. And we take that as a suggestion, not a command. And we hold things like honor mom and dad or, or thou shalt not kill higher than the Sabbath. And when you read this list, we see God places it right close to the top. It's right close to the top because there's something more to this than we realize. Now, how many of us wish we just had more hours in the day or just, just one more day in the week? It's just one of those things I want. I, I, I don't know about you, but I find myself in that boat all the time. There's just a not enough time in the day. I once heard it said, you know, if you want to get something done, you ask a busy person to do it because they get things done. And, you know, we live in a society of busyness now, don't we? We live in, in this, this, this busyness, go, 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 go society. We have stores that are open late at night. Like, they're open late and they're open seven days a week. And yet I still find myself sometimes outside the grocery store late at night wondering, why do they close at 9 and not 10? Or why do they close at 10 and not 11? And you know, come accustomed. We've become accustomed to being busy and to working. Regardless of whether we like it or not, we become accustomed to this busy lifestyle. I want to know how many of you remember when everything except gas stations were closed on Sundays. Bonnie puts up her hand. There's a, there's a couple of you who are scared to admit their age. I remember that. Gas stations and restaurants were open on Sundays. You know, and then... And then I remember when Shoppers Drug Mart said they would be open seven days a week. And that caused a stir. And I was young, and I remember thinking, what's the big deal? But it caused this mix of emotions among people. Some were happy, and others were upset. After all, it was Sunday. Who will have to work? You know, it's a Sunday. We're not used to that. And it was a big concern because everything was closed on Sunday. Now, now someone was going to have to work that day. And that was a concern. And now, now it's common in some larger centers to see Shoppers Drug Mart open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you think about it, the McDonald's drive through is open 24 hours a day as well. Things have changed. I don't know, maybe you need a Big Mac at 3 o'clock in the morning. Maybe at one time I did. I don't know. Nowadays, you know, just, just try applying for a job and tell them you need Sundays off to go to church, regardless of how inclusive Regardless, the, the hiring practices of businesses, they, they want to be so inclusive. They want you to work, though, when they're open. And if you say you need Sundays off, they might overlook you for somebody else. And, you know, because that doesn't work too well for them. And so that's why I say this message this morning is focused on the principle of the Sabbath. And not making sure you, you take Sundays off legalistically. Because if you want to get technical... The Sabbath begins on Friday evening and goes until Saturday evening. So the principle we're looking at this morning is the principle of a day of rest. And are you taking it? Are you taking it? And before I go any further, 
I want to throw a statistic out there for you. I'm going to take a drink. Oh, that singing wore me out. I want to throw a statistic out there for you. You know, it's mostly towards, like, the business owners out there who are, who are here watching at home or in the business, or in the service today. But this applies to everyone. So it doesn't matter if you're a farmer or if you're a stay-at-home mom, a tradesperson, or even a, a pastor. The statistics is something we all need to be aware of. And in the States, because after all, that's where all our statistics come from is the States, fast food restaurants are the busiest on Sundays. Sundays are the day. And if the average fast food restaurant in the States, it grosses over a million dollars every year. Every year it grosses over a million dollars average. And they're open seven days a week, and some, like I already said, are open 24 hours a day. Now, maybe you heard of a restaurant called Chick-fil-A. I actually expected someone to cheer. I think it was going to be Jardeth. But anyways, so maybe you've heard of a restaurant called Chick-fil-A. Well, they're closed on Sundays. They're not open 24 hours a day. And they make no bones about it at all. They're closed so staff can have a day of rest and a day of worship. That is on their website. The day off was implemented to give employees a chance to rest, spend time with family and friends, or set aside one day to worship if they so choose. Chick-fil-A does this. And so they're closed every Sunday because of that. The busiest and highest grossing day of the week for fast food restaurants, and they are closed. Hard to think of a business doing that and thinking it's a good idea. This this isn't really a a business practice you'd really want to pick up. But you want to know how much they gross every year? Over $5 million. Over $5 million. That's five times as much as the average fast food restaurant. And they're closed on the busiest day of the week for a day of rest and worship. Because the Sabbath is important. They understand the principle of rest. After all, the company's values are influenced and they were built on the Christian beliefs of its late founder. And she knew it was important that families had that day of rest. And as we read in Deuteronomy, it says, on that day, no one in your household may do any work. That's a hard business motto to follow. It's an even harder commandment to live up to. Exodus 16 says, the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it, they asked each other. They had no idea what it was, and Moses told them, it is the food the Lord has given you to eat. We're talking about the manna from heaven and the quail that the Lord gave the Israelites every morning as they wandered for 40 years. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was angry, was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its needs. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today, and set aside what is left for tomorrow. Remember, they haven't got the Ten Commandments yet. They they haven't got to that point in the story of their journey. The Lord is instituting this even before they give the Ten Commandments. Verse 24 says, So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good, without maggots or odor. Moses said, Eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth, 
So it'll be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must stay, each stay in your place. Do not go out, pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. During the exodus of Egypt, and in the 40 years of wandering, God looked after the Israelites. Even though they backed out on him at the very end and never went to the promised land, God still looked after them. God provided for them. Every day there was food for them, and they, and they were to take enough for the day. Leftovers were not a thing, lucky them. They, they had no use for them because it would spoil. And like I said, for anyone who took more than their daily bread limit, they found the next day the food, the food was rotten. It was full of maggots and it stunk, except for the Sabbath. On the morning before the Sabbath, on the sixth day, that morning they were called to collect double. So they would have enough for the day of rest. And that one day, only the seventh day, was a day where the food would not spoil or have maggots. A bit of a miracle happened for them, let alone the miracle of the food showing up every day. These leftovers didn't spoil like the rest of them. This went against the other six days. This was different. This was, this was significant. Now, some didn't believe that at all, and, and so they went out for the seventh day to gather. They found the Lord had no provisions for them on that day. And we need to hear that part. On the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, on the day of rest, those who went out to work, those who went out to, to gather the food like they'd been doing all week, there was none for them. The Lord had no provisions for those who worked on the Sabbath. God was making a point. And I just just want to point out what we read at the very beginning. All Scripture is used to teach us, is to correct us. And these examples are given to us to learn, to equip us. These incidents are recorded for us for a reason. And there's another incident actually as well in the book of Numbers where this man is collecting sticks on the Sabbath. And he's brought before Moses because of this. And the command of the Lord was was to kill him. Kill the man who was violating the Sabbath because, because he was picking up sticks, because he was working. After all, that is what the law required. God was serious when he commanded the rest. He made example of those who went against it. Example, Exodus 31 says, You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on the Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day he stopped working and was refreshed. God says, this is a covenant obligation for all time. Verse 16, this is a promise forever that we as his are to do this. Verse 17, it's a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. Now, because of Jesus, two things have happened. One, we're grafted into this lineage of God's people. We are part of that promise. We're part of this promise. So this obligation applies to us as well, just as all the commandments do. And two, this is the good part. I'm sure glad Jesus came to fulfill the law so we don't have to live by it. And so we're not judged and killed the same way as those other guys because I think a few of us would be hurting right now. Matthew 5 says, Don't misunderstand why I've come, Jesus says. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. So even though we're not held to the same standards that come with the law that was given to the children of God so long ago, we fall under grace now because of Jesus. And once again, that is how we are saved. We are saved by the grace of God, by the sanctification of Jesus Christ, not by works, and not by the law, and not by the Ten Commandments. And since he fulfilled the law, we are not held to the consequences of that law. But there is that still ongoing promise that God made, that permanent covenant that we read about. 
that we are still to fulfill it. And if we don't, there are still consequences. Mark 2 says, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people, and not people to meet the requirements for the Sabbath. It's there for you for a reason. And for a lot of people today, the Sabbath is the idea of church. A day, a day set aside where we gather together. That's what we think church is. Where we gather together for an hour or two. And we hear a message, and we worship in a group setting, and then we go about our day. And we feel that by, by doing that, we are keeping the Sabbath. Just as we read in Deuteronomy, you know, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. And I, and I think, I honestly think, we do really try. We really do try and do that. But the Sabbath was given to us as a commandment to rest for 24 hours. For a 24-hour period. Not as a duty for us just to put an hour in on a Sunday and call it good. The Sabbath was not created to force us to stop and worship God either. It wasn't instituted as this day where we were just supposed to go to church. But it was set up as a day that we're not to work and we are to observe God. As a day that we allow God to do his work in us and allow his provision to be shown in our life. A day where we can rest physically, mentally, and spiritually. And God leads by example right from the very start. And you know, Genesis 2 says, on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. And so he rested from all his work and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. This is now where we get really legalistic. And we start to draw a line in the sand and we try to define what work is and, and, and what rest isn't. We, we want to define that, that line. And this topic can fall into the exact idea we, we sometimes argue with, with tithing. Because the tithing comes along and the Sabbath come along and we're, we're interested in these topics. But, but, but we try to figure them out. We try to find some, some gray area where we balance in between there. Do we give 10% off the gross? Do we give 10% off the net? Do, do we tithe on this? Do we tithe on that? And the same thing we balance around with discussing work. Well, what do we consider work? Can I cut my grass on the day off or is that work? These are discussions we have and we wonder because truthfully we want to do things right. But at the same time, we, we've got things we want to do and things we have to get done. And so we wonder, what is work and what isn't work? I enjoy cutting my grass. So, so where, is it, where is the balance in all this? And when we get to that point, we start missing this whole principle of rest altogether. And that is, do we truly trust God for all of our provisions as well? Do we mean it? When we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Do we trust God that the grass can grow a little bit longer today and tomorrow I'll be able to cut it? Do we trust God to be able to take that one day, to take 24 hours and just rest from work? And it seems quite trivial and almost humorous to us. It just, it just seems that way. But to God, this is very important. This was number four in his top ten. And when we look at the creation part of Scripture where God rested, you know, we could spend so much time focusing on the fact that, you know, God could have, could have done that in 10 days. He could have got it done in one day. He could have done it in a thousand days. Or that he really didn't need any time at all to do any of it. But God takes the time to not only stop creating and rest, but he makes the point of, of telling us. And he does this not out of exhaustion. He doesn't do this because he needs a break. But he created that day of rest for a reason. He made it holy, which means he set it apart from the rest. He set apart one day from the rest for us to be able to rest. Not a day to get caught up on work, what we've missed or we've fallen behind on. Not a day to collect sticks for tomorrow or a day where we're to reply to those, to those work emails or to return those phone calls 
or things like that. You know, we have these apps now that just, you click like that and you're on work. And you're on your work email and you'll be sitting there with the family doing something and you're just scrolling through it. What a great day to be working. It's a day to get caught up on with you and your loved ones. A day where there, there's no distraction from your relationship with God and your family. That's what God intended for the Sabbath. A day for you and him to hang out so you can be recharged and ready to go with all the things he has in store for you for the week. And when you research what Jewish people did or what they do on the Sabbath, a lot of it involves eating, which is a good thing, but it was a time that they, they just did, did really nothing. They, they'd go back and forth to worship. They, they'd focus on themselves. They'd spend family time together. It was a day where their mental health was totally restored. And in a society where we're talking about mental health all the time, I think we all need to take a Sabbath a little bit longer. And, and we look around, we just look around ourselves Look around our workplace. Look around the schools. We're all busy. And we all allow that busyness to consume us. And I got busted with that with this week as well. I've been meaning to have a meeting with someone for a while now. And time has just slipped away. And a lot of people say to me, Lee, I know you're busy, and I don't want to disturb you, or I don't want to bother you. And you know, that's true, I am busy, but I want you to disturb me. I want you to bother me, because we're all busy. But we do need to stop and take time to connect we need to stop and, and take time to connect with each other. And because, you know, because life is like that. If we don't stop and take time to, uh, to make these appointments with each, with each other, we can get real busy. And time is just gone once again. And if we don't take that time or schedule in those appointments, we, we put them off and we put them off and we forget. And a conversation that was meant to happen a month ago Turns out to be something totally different about a year later if they ever get around to it. So just as we need to take the time to, to schedule in those appointments and make sure that we are actually having them, our spiritual health and well-being is just the same way as well. We need a point. We need to make a point of scheduling that one-day break every week or else we just won't do it. Regardless if you, if you think you're doing it right or wrong, just by me saying the word work, we've all thought of something we have to do. As I was walking around, I almost opened up my work emails today to go through them, and I caught myself, I can't do that, especially if I'm preaching on this. You know, we've all thought of something we've had to do, haven't we? Just with that word work, you know, there's, there's a meeting coming up I'm thinking of, or there's a call to make, or an email to return, or a list to complete. And, and just by being diligent and making a list of things I need to do when I get back to work, or reading that email while, while I wait for something. I just worked on the Sabbath. And then I'm just as guilty as the guy who was picking up sticks. And once again, I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the Sabbath was a day created and commanded to be a day where we took time not to overlook our relationship with God. And with those near to us. It was a day that was designed to give you time to rest. God intended a day where work and talk about work and thoughts about work stopped. A day of relax and recharge. I should have done this next Sunday on Father's Day. I think a lot of dads would have liked that. Nope, it's my Sabbath. And if you can't stop and do that, if you're not taking the time to do that, God isn't going to command you to be put to death. God's not going to do that. Because the reality is, if you don't take that time you're already killing yourself. Think about the stress. Think about the heart attacks and all, all the, the health issues that go with those who don't take time to rest. You know, there, there's those overseas who literally work themselves to death. They die in their desk because they don't take a break. And if we don't take time to rest, we'll find ourselves worn out. We'll find ourselves breaking down. Our bodies will break down either mentally or physically. And it's not, we don't do this on purpose. We don't set out to do that on purpose. And as a pastor, you know, I understand that. You know, it's obvious that Sundays are not my Sabbath. And you know, it may not be yours either. But for me, as, as I was preparing for this message this week, this was once again a reminder that 
I have not. I have not been taking regular Sabbaths at all. I, you know, I, I tend to save mine up and, and take a week off here or there. And, and that works sometimes. But that's not the right thing to do. You know, a year ago, I was at a point in my old job. You know, I was a manager and, a, and I was always thinking about work. I carried two phones with me all the time. One was my personal phone, the other was my work phone. Even on holidays, I carried my work phone with me. And I was on call all the time, 24-7. And I was always thinking about work. I hated it. I was, I was planning things six months in advance. And I was always had that thought, of, you know, going on in my head, you know, I was thinking about budgets, or I, or, I was, or I was thinking about financial goals all the time. I paid attention to the weather and the holidays and what was happening in the community because those were marketing opportunities. And when it wasn't the, the business, uh, well, the co-op I was working at, it was, when it wasn't focusing on that, I was always looking at the schedule of what I had to do, how I could balance, you know, doing stuff with the church and with work, and I'd get going back and forth. And I, I finally found myself stressed out having to go back to work. The worst part of my holiday was coming to the point where I knew I had to go back to work. And so I'd go in a day before my holiday was over to make sure all the junk was taken care of, to make sure all the fires were put out. So when I come back to work, I'd be fine. It didn't make any sense, but it did to me. And then one morning I found myself sitting on the edge of my bed talking with God. And I was getting ready for work. And I was saying, God, what's changed? I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. Something has to have changed. Something's had to have changed. What's going on? Something needs to change. Or the outcome's not going to be good, God. I knew my health was at stake because I, I am a prime athletic body, no heart attack problems at all. I knew my happiness was dwindling down. It was only a matter of time until something snapped. And God said to me, where's your Sabbath? What about me? Where's our time together? And I realized in the busyness of just doing everything, I stopped. And it wasn't just, in the, it wasn't just like, okay, I'm not preparing anything for the church. Or I'm doing this. I stopped having my Sabbath. And I realized how dangerous that was and what was actually happening. Life was consuming me. Where was this God of rest? Where, where, where was the God of joy? Why am I not leaning on those everlasting arms of God? And I realized something needed to change. Something had to change. And so I changed the one thing I could. I switched jobs. I took the easy way out instead of having to redo my schedule. I, I just switched jobs. And honestly, that was a scary thing. I was making real good money. We got accustomed to a lifestyle. But I knew life was more than just, just that money. And I never wanted to live just for retirement. After all, my kids were getting older. I was missing out on so much stuff. I was never going to get this time back. So I asked myself a question. Do I trust God? How important is a Sabbath to me? If I put him first, will he provide? Can I trust him? Because something needs to change. And I have to say, so far, so good. The Sabbath is probably one of the hardest things we as Christians really have to follow. Because we've gotten to the point where, where we feel that if we're not doing something, then we're really doing nothing. And we forget that resting in the Lord isn't this, this laziness. But resting in the Lord is actually doing a lot. And resting the Lord means that you're trusting the Lord as well. You're trusting the Lord for his provisions. You're trusting the Lord for your daily bread. You are trusting the Lord beyond your means. And that's one of those things we must never lose sight of. And as true disciples, we must get into the habit and the discipline of taking back our Sabbath, all 24 hours of it. And all the blessings and the provisions of God will come with it. Back to the book of Exodus. It says, some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, let me teach you. Let me teach you. We can go on a, on a thousand different rampages about what work is. We can go on, on all these different directions of what, what we need to do on the Sabbath. But what we need to do is let Jesus teach us what that really means. Because we do need to be taught to take a day off just as the Lord intended. This message this morning was pointed at one thing. And that one thing is keeping the Lord's day. Something that's echoed throughout his word, right throughout the Bible, from Genesis right at the start all the way through. The principle of rest is something we as disciples, that we as Christians cannot deny. It is a command given to us, not out of duty, but out of love. It's not a legalistic hold on to Sunday type of thing. It is a day that God has said, don't do anything. Just come over and hang out with me. Hang out with your family. Focus on those things that really matter. It's a day where me and my family shall not toil, but rest in him and his joy. And trust him for our provisions always. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your day. I will rejoice, Father God, in your day. And I, I want to say again and again, thank you. But Lord, let us not lose sight of what your day really is. It is a day for you, where we can rest in you, where we can recharge in you, where we find ourselves pulled close to our Father in love and embrace, not in a legalistic way at all, Father God. Lord, I pray that you would help us reclaim the Sabbath, all 24 hours of it. And Father God, we know it's going to take time. We know it's a practice. We know it's a discipline. We know all that, Father God. So we ask that you would just bless us as we try and do this, Father God. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that we're saved by your grace and not by the works or anything else. So Lord, we once again say thank you, but help us move more and more to be like you. And Lord, we know you rested on those days. Father God, let us follow your lead. And Lord, let us, let us go from here safely and let us return once again. May you bless us, protect us, love us, and keep us. And we ask all in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week.